in chat. I'll try to monitor it. And um, but I think you know if we have some give and take, it's probably a, a good thing rather than just. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll I'll let people do what they want. But I, I will try to monitor the chat. And if anybody is unsure at this point, there is a little button down at the bottom called chat. And if you click on that, uh, a chat box opens where you can either send a question to everyone or you can also send questions to specific people. And I guess, Jeff, you, uh, if you'd like it, we can, we can, we can go ahead and Should we go ahead and start. Sure. Okay. okay, good. So um, welcome, everybody. Um, our speaker today is Matt Emerton, who's a um, colleague of mine at the University of Chicago and an expert on the Langlands program. <clears throat> I don't actually see the title on his slide, and I forget exactly what it is, but I think it, it's kind of an overview of aspects of the Langlands program. Um, uh, and I'm very much looking forward because Matt's usually a very clear expositor. So I will turn it over to him. And if you have questions, um, yeah, please post them in chat or interrupt if that seems appropriate. So Matt, why don't you go ahead? Thank you. So thank you for the introduction. So I guess, yeah, I should have put the title on, on here. It's something like an introduction to the language program, which is an ambitious title, which will not at all, I think, be realized in the talk but maybe the talk is kind of an introduction to an introduction or like an, an overview of what an introduction could involve if there was enough time to really delve into a true introduction. And so, in, so the format of the talk will just be to essentially, as I said, to kind of go through the notes and talk about them. And so also Min Hong emailed out the notes, I think to all the participants here. So you can follow along at home in your own copy if, if you want to, and that will be, uh, less frustrating than trying to follow me scrolling up and down on my machine here. But just before um, I start reading through the notes, I want to make some sort of uh, comment about overall what the Langlands program is perhaps doing for a number theorist. And it originated as a program in number theory, which has a slight physical metaphor to it, which physicists could decide it's you know, a little pretentious, but in any case, some way to think, and then it will hopefully come out in the talk, which is that uh, in the language program as number theorists think about it, there are kind of two sides, which can be called the, um, the motivic side and the automorphic side, or the Gawa side and the automorphic side. But also you could call it the diophantine side and the automorphic side. So, so Gawa and motive are both words that are connected to um, arithmetic geometry. So you know, algebraic geometry, say, over the um, rational numbers or over the integers. And, um, and diophantine is a more classical word to do with you know, algebraic geometry over the integers or the rational numbers. And ultimately, what one is sort of doing, the operation that's happening on the diophantine side at base is counting solutions to diophantine equations modulo primes. And so in some sense, it's happening kind of in a physical space. You're physically counting some numbers and you get what people will call them point counts. So you, you have, for example, as it's written here at the top of page one, a variety defined over Q, where there could be lots of adjectives put onto this variety. Maybe smooth and projective might be the best set of adjectives to put, but it doesn't matter too much. I'm not going to be very precise. I'm going to give some examples later that are projective and smooth curves, and I'll have some other examples that are um, affine. An affine variety is, of course, the easiest to write down because if you write down an affine variety, you're just writing down this list of equations, maybe F1 up to FR, in some variables, X1 up to XN, with rational coefficients. Hey, guys, and how's it going? It's been a while. One um, observation you can make. I'm good. I'm make. in Boston these days, actually. Over I think somebody's... Ago. Should... My boyfriend. Could everybody please mute unless they're asking a question? So, um, so these equations, F1 up to FR, although they have rational number coefficients, there's only finitely many coefficients in these finitely many equations. And so really, they have some bounded denominators. Maybe the denominators are bounded by this number n. And so they really have coefficients in this ring, z adjoin 1 over n, and then the polynomial variables, which means that we can reduce the modulo uh, primes 
if we have a prime that doesn't divide n, then we can reduce these equations modulo p and we can get us the look at the same set of equations and solve them over the finite field fp. And so we get a point count for each prime p, excluding some finite list of primes, we get a number, which is a number of points. And so that's some pretty physical process. And sort of what's going to happen on the automorphic side of the Langlands correspondence, which will come many slides later, is that we um, will have eigenvectors for some operators, also labeled by primes, and there'll be eigenvalues. And so in some sense, this point count is kind of the some kind of physical observable or something, some very classical thing, which is being measured by these eigenvalues on the other side. And that's the kind of basic mechanism of the, what the Langlands correspondence is supposed to do from the point of view of a number theorist, is it's supposed to relate some spectral theory and some uh, eigenvalues of operators to some physical point count of solutions to Diophantine equations. The fact that such a kind of the fact that these two kind of complementary descriptions of the same list of numbers should exist is not obvious and it was not easy to discover kind of that's heuristically and historically and um and the kind of precise description is pretty elaborate but that's a basic kind of point of idea or the basic point of view from a from a number theorist point of view but i want to begin by talking about these point counts because they'll lead to l functions and l functions at least in reality and also historically were an important sort of um, motivation for, for the way Langlands formulated his correspondence. And so I want to say a little bit about that. Um, and also along the way, these point counts will be converted into something that's a little also less physical and a little more um, theoretical as well. And we'll see that as we go along. Uh, when I say physical, I mean that's a little less concrete. So we'll interpret these point counts in a slightly more sophisticated way as well while still staying on the Diophantine side. So there'll be, kind of, there'll be sort of a reinterpretation of these point counts on the Diophantine side, and then ultimately the Langlands correspondence will be a much more elaborate reinterpretation of them on a spectral theory side, on the automorphic side. And uh, um, we think of these points as uh, fixed points of uh, the action of the Galois group on the... Uh, yes, the so I'll come, I'll come to that in a few slides, actually. Thank you. So, um, so one thing is that, instead of just getting a single number for each prime, by looking at the number of points, not only in FP, but in its finite extension, sort of F sub P to the N, we get a sequence of numbers even for each prime. And we organize these into an L function. So there's a traditional way to do that. Sorry, sorry could I ask a question? Uh, a simple uh, sure. question. So your coefficients were in uh, one over N times Z. Yeah. Why not just multiply by n and consider all the coefficients in z? Is uh, I mean, no, no, oh yeah, there's no, there, on the one hand, there's no reason not really to do that. You could definitely try to do that. On the other hand, um, what's maybe a bit Im implicit here is that in some sense, if you, if the reduction of these, for example, suppose these f's were cutting out something smooth, but modulo p, the thing they cut out was singular, then perhaps this point count wouldn't, this naive point count may not be the co completely correct invariant to compute anyway. So whether, e even if we uh, engage in the process you said, which certainly is a completely reasonable thing to do, the, the kind of numbers you're computing at primes of bad, people will say of bad reduction, and maybe not, maybe not the sort of correct things to be computing. And so, um, so throughout the talk, I'm always gonna be throwing away a finite list of primes when I define L functions, when I look at these point counts. And there's actually a lot of effort invested into to not doing that. And the first step will be certainly the one that you just said, which will be to kind of scale away denominators so you could reduce modulo every prime. But there'd be more, you'd have to do more steps than that to really correct what's happening at the bad primes. So because I don't want to do them all, I'm just not going to do any of them. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. So, so there's a sort of a tradition where one ar arranges these numbers in um, say a power series in T, which you then write as the log of some other power series. And I mean, probably a lot of people here know there are lots of sort of reasons for writing things this way, but I'm not gonna fuss too much about the precise motivations for why you use this generating function and not another one. But one nice thing that happens when you do organize the, the generating function this way is that this Z sub P of X comma T is a rational function of T. 
it's not an obvious fact, but it's um, a consequence of the cohomological formula for counting these points that was alluded to in a question and, and that we'll come to. And it was also uh, actually first proved by Dwork in some other way. But so one gets this rational function of t, and, and that's, which is essentially measuring kind of the number of solutions this Diophantine equation has modulo the prime p. And you have one of those for each prime p. So you can then take a product of those functions and organize them into a single function, which is kind of an invariant of the original Diophantine equations over q. So that's what I'm calling zeta sub x, and it's a function of s. So you want, there's a sort of, uh, I mean, there's lots of, um, again, lots of history and tradition behind why you do things in a certain way. But roughly, if you're going to be counting these points and then you're going to be combining point counts with different primes, you want to have a weight that's connected to the prime as well. And so you, you replace a variable t at the prime p, you replace it by p to the minus s. So this expression zp x p to the minus s is now a rational function in the variable p to the minus s. And then you take a product of these over all primes p. And again, I'm excluding finitely many bad primes. And there's you know, a kind of um, theory as to what you should do to complete the zeta function and add in factors of those primes, but I'm not going to worry too much about that. Instead, I'm just going to give you some examples of what these rational functions and hence zeta functions look like. So the kind of stupidest example, but still worth thinking about is when x is just a single point. And then it just has one point modulo every prime p. And it has only one point when you go to any extension of fp because it's just a point. And so you just have a coefficient of one over n times t to the n. And that's log of one minus t to the minus one. And so this zeta function is one over one minus t. And then if you plug in p to the minus s and take a product over all primes, you get the Riemann zeta function. So the Riemann zeta function is an example of one of these zeta functions for the point. If I do an affine space, then an affine space will have uh, of dimension m, then if my field has q elements, the affine space of dimension m will have q to the m points in it. And so, so, so when I compute the zeta function for affine space, there'll just be a power, there'll be like a p to the n to the m multiplying this t to the n. So it will essentially look pretty much the same as a point, except that there'll be a scaling of, of t by a power of p. And when you um, replace t by p to the minus s, that scaling is, looks even simpler. And you just end up getting the Riemann zeta function, but with a shift. And if you do the zeta function of um, projector space, and you count points there, well, you, of course, you can sort of tie all projective space by an affine m space, and then an affine m minus one space, and then an affine m minus two space, and so on, the usual kind of uh, cell decomposition of projective space. And you can count the points in each cell separately and then add them up. And you see that the zeta function for projective space is a product of shifts of the Riemann zeta function. So the very simplest varieties, basically, um, you know, affine space or projective spaces or other very simple uh, kind of rational varieties, the, the zeta function that I'm describing will just end up being a kind of product of Riemann zeta functions with the arguments shifted in some way. Um, sort of the, maybe the first sort of uh, interesting example in that it gives you something that's not just a Riemann zeta function is if you took an elliptic curve. So if you take, take an elliptic curve well, over FP, the number of points will be, uh, as is pretty well known, is um, the general, Oh, sorry, there's a typo here. So the number of points over FP will be one plus P minus some quantity. So you should you sort of think that this elliptic curve is a curve. If it was P1, it would have one plus P points over FP, the P finite points in a point at infinity. So it's not P1, it's an elliptic curve. So you kind of count its points by writing them as one plus P minus some defect. And then if you compute over P to FP to the N, you should have one plus P to the N. So there's a typo there, it should be one plus P to the N minus a defect, but it turns out that the defect is always just given by the difference of two nth powers of some invariance. These numbers alpha and beta, which turn out to be algebraic numbers at absolute value square root of p. So that's the so-called Hasse-Ve formula for computing points on an elliptic curve. And so if you plug that into the formula for the zeta function, 
and just manip manipulate logs and so on in the usual way, you get this expression for the zeta function if you had an elliptic curve over Q and then you looked at it modulo all the primes P and did this um, point count, you get this formula. So you have a, you have zeta of S and zeta of S minus one. So those are, let me just remind you, that's what you would have if you'd done the zeta function of P1. So you kind of see the zeta function of P1, but then it's divided by something else, which is kind of the contributions from these alpha and betas. So this other thing, which is traditionally called the L function of E, just for historical reasons, is, um, is kind of measuring the sort of the defect of the zeta function from just being the zeta function of P1. So it's measuring the defect of E from being just a gen of zero. And uh, well, it's, it's a thing, it's whatever, whatever this Dirichlet series is that you get by multiplying out these factors. Um, probably just one thing I should say for terminology is that these uh, zeta functions and L functions that I'm writing down and normally, if you have to give them a name, they're normally called Hasseve zeta functions. But they also, um, in the special case of, uh, if your variety was zero dimensional, so over Q, of course, there's not just the, po the point is not the only zero dimensional variety over Q because it's not algebraically closed. So if I take an irreducible polynomial with coefficients in Q, say of degree D, the solution set will be kind of D points geometrically, but over Q, they'll be indistinguishable and they're kind of a different variety over Q to D disjoint points. That's because you know polynomial with D linear factors each of which is of the form X minus a rational number is different to a polynomial of degree D, which is irreducible over Q. So they are kind of, you know, they're more zero dimensional varieties over Q than just a point. And the kind of functions that arise in that case, the zeta functions that you get in that case are related to what are called R to L functions. So, so these kind of zeta or L functions we're looking at, they have Hasser and Bayes name attached to them and also Arten, Emil Arten's name but also kind of Grothendieck's name because Grothendieck was the one who developed the cohomological formalism that was alluded to earlier in a question, which is you can compute this zeta function at, via a fixed point count. So you can think about your variety. If we go back to X over FP to the N, you can think about your variety X. Uh, if you look over FP bar, the algebraic closure of FP, you're really now looking at something algebraic geometric. You're working over an algebraically closed field. And there's an automorphism of uh, FP bar, which is raising to the pth power, whose fixed points are FP, or the fixed points of the nth power of that automorphism are FP to the n. And so counting the, the um, points defined over FP to the n is the same as counting the fixed points under the nth power of an automorphism. And so then it's like Lefschetz fixed point formula you know, gives you a formula for the zeta function as it, um, well, when you sort it all out, as a determinant of this um, automorphism on uh, the cohomology, really an alternating product of determinants on the cohomology in various degrees. And if you're looking at, uh, just if you're looking at uh, varieties that aren't proper, that aren't projective, then I guess the correct thing to do is to take compactly supported cohomology. Of course, if X is projective, then that's the same as the usual cohomology. And of course, the cohomology should be allotic cohomology because that's the kind of cohomology theory that makes sense in characteristic P. And there's also a kind of, it doesn't really matter, but just a minor point is that the Fabinius you use should not be actually the raising to the pth power map. You use the inverse to that map which is, you know, extracting a p root. Um, that's called geometric Frobenius. The other one is called arithmetic Frobenius, and there's a traditional reason that people use geometric Frobenius instead. Matt? Yes. That formula looks, I mean, excuse my ignorance, but it looks like something that could come out of a computation in some topological field theory. Do you or anybody else on this seminar know whether there is, it is possible to obtain that by some computation in a topological field theory? I certainly don't, but probably other people do. But all right, well, no one is speaking it, but, up, so <laughs> yeah, I guess um you'd need a field theory that's calculating elatic cohomology. Yeah. So 
but the, it's all homology. Yeah, but the analog, like if you had a variety, if you had a variety over the complex numbers and it happened to have an automorphism, and you wanted to compute these fixed points, then you could you know, use rational cohomology. And then I guess this would be um, uh, like a, I mean, these would be like a dynamical zeta function. Like a, I don't know if people call them like a left shed zeta function, or I'm not sure exactly what the terminology is. Just, you know, like the, so, they're, so they're, they're the same kind of formulas that appear in um, kind of in like, well, dynamical systems people use to, uh, you know, like generating functions for kind of, fixed points under the iterates of an automorphism of a manifold or something like that. Well, I mean, it's also very much like a left shift fixed point theorem or a, a yeah. Tia bot yeah, yeah. fixed point theorem. Yeah, very um, much. And, and those, of course, to address what Jeff said, I mean, those, of course, can be uh, derived, re-derived from supersymmetric uh, quantum mechanics, supersymmetric field theories. Right. Again, so I guess bot. I'm asking whether there's some piatic version of well, indeed, right. So you'd need, you'd need to have some kind of supersymmetric quantum mechanics or whatever, um, where the supersymmetric states are calculated not by, you know, our usual right. Ram cohomology or, or, or harmonic forms, but rather by some kind of um, etal cohomology. Uh -huh. Right. Interesting. Okay, so, thanks. So, um, so, so that's the kind of formula for, for this uh, individual factor at the prime P. And then if you put it all together, we get this formula for uh, the zeta function of the variety, the original X over Q, where I've kind of rearranged the product. So I've done the product over degrees on the outside and the product over primes on the inside. Um, and then the product over primes, again, I'm sorry, there's another typo, capital T should now be P to the minus S. Um, and so, uh, but there's a kind of, there's a shift you can make, which is that sort of prima facie in this formula for each prime P, this compactly supported cohomology is you kind of reduce mod P and you do a computation of some kind of com compactly supported cohomology of that variety mod P. But actually you could compute the cohomology of the variety X over Q bar. And that's a computation you can make over, you know, independent of any prime P. And in fact, that will be the same as taking the complex points and computing just the usual compactly supported cohomology with Q coefficients, say, and then extending scalars to QL. Um, and that cohomology has an action of the Galois group of Q bar over Q. So the elatic cohomology, if you take a variety over Q and you compute its elatic cohomology, it has a, has a kind of Galois action of Galois Q bar over Q. And inside Galois Q bar over Q, well, there's a little asterisk here that I'll come to in a moment, but it's not super important for now. Inside Galois Q bar over Q, there are basically elements labeled by primes called Frobenius elements. And they're basically constructed so that when you do a reduction modulo P, they turn into the Frobenius mod P. And so what you can think is that in this formula for the zeta function, this, this HI, is not a different group for each prime P with a, with a separate, separate Frobenius symmetry for each prime P. You can think it's a single vector space that depends only on X over Q, that it has an action of a big Galois group, the Galois group of Q over Q on it, and that inside there, there are these elements labeled by primes. And so now you're just singling out a particular element of that Galois group and computing this determinant for that particular element from P to get the pth factor. So it's a sort of small but important shift. It's essentially, so another way to say it is that this HI is kind of unif like independent of P. And just to address, I think it was Greg's comment earlier, this, this step where I'm saying that this HI over all the different primes could be computed by a, a single HI all at once over Q, this is a step where I would have to throw away some bad primes now if I hadn't thrown them away before. I'm sorry, sorry for the ignorant question, but L here is any prime other than P, and it doesn't. Yeah, yeah. Either, well, in some sense, before is it canonically was, isomorphic for different choices of L? Is that right? No. So that was so it was correct before that L was exactly a prime independent of P. Now I'm looking over all P's, so L is any L, and again, there's a subtlety where I shouldn't. The the point is that what will happen is 
these QL vector spaces, the representations won't be isomorphic as L changes, but the determinants you compute of Fabianus will be independent of L. So it means that when you compute this factor for the given P, you can choose any L that's not equal to that P and you'll get the same answer. And so the L is kind of a moving target. So we really, as I will say in, on the slides in a moment, we really want to kind of imagine that there's kind of a family of Galois representations, one for each prime L. They're technically in some like literal sense quite different as L changes because the, the Galois group has some perfinite topology and the Atlantic numbers have some essentially perfinite topology and, and the representation has those topologies interact. And, and so they, they kind of literally are quite different as L changes. But in some others, if you step back slightly, they're almost the same because the invariants they produce, these determinants of Fabianus, are the same whichever L you choose, as long as when you're computing it for the prime P, you just make sure you don't take L to be P. So, um, and just kind of another comment related to bad primes is that in fact, inside the Galois group of Q, G, Q, they really aren't these Fabanius elements. They're maybe what you could call Fabanius cosets. They're some kind of cosets of some subgroup of GQ. But really what will happen is that this action will factor through a certain quotient of GQ called GQS, as some quotient of GQ related to choosing a particular set of bad primes. And in this quotient, these FROB P's make sense as long as P is not in the finite set S. So again, there's kind of some finite set of bad primes that's being fixed that's, you know, whatever that finite set is that's germane to the particular X that we were talking about. And from P makes sense as long as P is not in S. And I'm not going to, and again, I'm not going to address what should be happening to the, in the Euler product. I'm not going to address what should happen at the bad primes in S. There's a thing that should happen, but it's, but it's not, it's complicated enough to kind of discuss the good primes. So, um, and so, well, sort of in the optic I just gave, you kind of see a way to build, well, I've written here zeta slash L functions, because whether you call them zeta functions or L functions is a little bit nuanced and it's partly just a fact feature of history. It's not really a very important distinction. Um, so probably I'll call them L functions from now on, because that's sort of what people do, but the reason for it is not, not an especially good one, it's just some tradition. So you can think that you're gonna build these zeta functions out of a representation of this Gawa group. You're going to have an action of GQ on some elliptic vector space, or exactly kind of in relation, you know, exactly what was related to Greg's question. There'll really be kind of a compatible family of elliptic representations of the Galois group, where compatible means that outside a set of bad primes, this characteristic polynomial of Fabanius is independent of L, as long as you take L to be different from P. And, um, and if you're in that situation, you can kind of copy the previous formula and write down an, a, a kind of a, an L function. Depends on the representation rho. So you could write rho or you could write V depending on if you want to emphasize rho or V. And it's a function of the complex variable S. Of course, you need this characteristic polynomial to, when we say this characteristic polynomial is independent of L, partly what's implicit there, in order to have numbers make sense that are independent of L, they should be rational numbers so that they sit inside every QL. Or maybe um, when, when I say elliptic vector space, I could also imagine having coefficients not in QL, but in some finite extension of QL. And then these, these polynomials could have uh, algebraic number coefficients. So that the algebraic numbers will be sitting inside, they'll be kind of you know, sitting inside all these different uh, extensions of QL. So the algebraic numbers kind of the algebraic closure of Q bar sits inside the algebraic closure of every QL. So, so this notion of uh, independence of L kind of implicitly has built into it, the idea that the coefficients of this characteristic polynomial should be algebraic numbers rather than, than random analytic numbers. And, and that turns out to be true. And we saw a special case of it. I mean, at least I kind of implicitly brought up a special case of it in this formula here, where this alpha and beta, they were coming about as, um, traces of something acting on H1 with a lot of coefficients, but they were actually algebraic numbers and they were independent of L. And this formula is related, or, or, or the, more generally this growth index formula for point counting is kind of, it's the basic reason why these characteristic polynomials can be independent of L. 
because these, these, these um, the, the eigenvalues of Frobenius on these elatic vector spaces or the, the traces of Frobenius on these elatic vector spaces are ultimately connected to some point count and this point count doesn't use L. And so these numbers, these alphas and betas don't depend on L and the algebraic numbers. And so that ultimately kind of causes these um, characteristic polynomials to, to have algebraic number coefficients rather than just elatic coefficients. And so that means that this formula really makes sense as a complex function of S. So some kind of Dirichlet series of S. So just to kind of show some more examples, like the, the trivial character, that, that'll be the kind of cohomology of a point, which has a one dimensional vector space with no interest in Gower action. That's the trivial group action. That will give, give us the Riemann zeta function again. It's just a reinterpretation of the previous computation for a point. So here's um, a reinterpretation of the computation for A1. So it turns out that the, um, so if we compute the zeta function of A1, I already told you it was zeta of S minus one. But if you think about it cohomologically, you have to think about what the first, you have to think about what the compactly supported cohomology of the affine line looks like. And so it has um, no compactly supported H0, no compactly supported H1. It, I mean, the, if I think of it as a complex affine line, it has kind of a compactly supported H2, which has a fundamental, so there's sort of a fundamental class in H2 with compact supports on the affine line. And that um, fundamental class, if you think about how you compute it, it's sort of dual to the pi one of a punctured disk. If you think about how you compute fundamental classes of Riemann surfaces, the fundamental class in cohomology is kind of dual to the um, pi one of a punctured disk. But how does Gawa, how does the Gawa group act on the pi one of a punctured disk. Well, if you think about the circle being kind of a, the basis for pi one around a punctured disk, the circle is filled out by roots of unity. And so Gawa acts on pi one of a punctured disk by acting on those roots of unity. They're the kind of algebraic numbers sitting inside the circle that Gawa can act on. And so, um, so the Gawa action on the fundamental class of the affine line is dual, so inverse to the Gawa action on roots of unity. So I have to do, um, so if I think about how does Frobenius act on a root of unity, well, the, 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 the Frobenius in the naive sense would raise, raise a root of unity to the pth power. I told you that my frob p was the inverse of that. So my frob p raises a root of unity to the p to the inverse power. So the cyclotomic character, that, char that representation is called the cyclotomic character. So it's sending frob p to this exponent, p to the minus one. So the inverse cyclotomic character is sending from P to P. So that's kind of the action of the P Frobenius on the fundamental class of A1. And we recover, so we recover the um, zeta function of A1, which is the Riemann zeta function with the translation coming from this Gauss action on the fundamental class. So sort of this, this uh, particular character. Here's an elliptic curve. Uh, so y squared is x2 minus x. So that's the elliptic curve, a famous elliptic curve. is one that has complex multiplication by z join i. Just to kind of convince you of that, I've written down the formula for the complex multiplication by i. So it's a very symmetric elliptic curve. So we can write, it turns out we can write down its uh, L function. So again, before when I computed the zeta function of elliptic curve, I had kind of these three pieces. But if we think about where they're coming from cohomologically, we can see that the zeta of s is coming from the point because the h naught of the elliptic curve is the same as h naught of a point. So this zeta of s is zeta of s of the point. And then we can see the zeta of s minus one by the discussion we just had is coming from the fundamental class in h2. So that's kind of the contribution from h2 of the elliptic curve. And this denominator is coming from the h1. And that's why it has its own special notation and is kind of really sing singled out as being dependent on E because it's the H1 of the elliptic curve that distinguishes it from other curves. The H0 and the H2 are no different for the elliptic curve than for any other curve or any other Riemann surface, but it's the H1 that's kind of really dependent on the curve. So what I'm doing on this slide is I'm just focusing on the, represent the Gower representation on the H1. So I'm not thinking about the other H0 and the H2. I'm just gonna think about the H1 and so that, um, so I, so I'm going to be computing exactly that denominator in the zeta function of the elliptic curve. 
And there's a formula for it. I mean, it's not obvious, but it comes from the theory of counting points on this elliptic curve. And here's the formula. I've written it as a product over Gaussian primes. So the Gaussian, the prime numbers in the Gaussian integers are, there's a unique kind of even prime number, which is one plus i. One plus i, when you square it, gives you two i, which is two times a unit. So one plus i is a kind of the unique even prime in the Gaussian integers, and then there are all the other primes, I'll call them odd. And already when you talk about primes in the integers, of course, if you have um, a prime ideal in the, in the integers, will be, you know, like the prime ideal generated by five is also generated by minus five. So from a kind of ideal theoretic point of view, five and minus five are equally good generators of um, the prime ideal, five. But five has some other property, which is that it's positive. And that's kind of a way to distinguish five as maybe being better than minus five. And so when you look at, art, when you look at Gaussian prime numbers, they have, they have four signs, sort of four signs you can multiply by. There's plus minus one and also plus minus i. But also they're complex numbers. So there's no notion of positive to, dis, to, to sort of favor one over the other. But we can kind of favor one over the other by looking at how they reduce modulo, it turns out, one plus i cubed. It turns out that any odd prime number will be congruent to either one minus one i or minus i modulo one plus i cubed. And you can scale it by a choice of one i minus one or minus i to make it be congruent to one. So every odd prime number has a kind of, or every you know, odd prime ideal has a unique kind of representative, a unique, unique generator that's congruent to one mod one plus i cubed. So, so this congruence condition is the same as kind of in an Euler product of the kind we had before, taking the product over positive primes and not including negative primes. So here we're taking a product over just these odd primes that satisfy this congruence. And here's a formula. It's pi to the one minus s times the pi conjugate to the minus s or to the minus one. And the way you raise to these minus s powers and the way you avoid indeterminacy is you collect these minus s powers and you think of them as pi times pi conjugate to the minus s. And that will be a kind of positive integer because it's a product of this algebraic integer and its conjugate. And so you, know, you kind of know what it means to raise that to the minus s unambiguously. And you can, you can kind of write this product another way because you can say that, um, Again, these, these Gaussian primes are kind of classified and it's not so hard to classify them. They come in two flavors. For example, three is a, is a prime number, which is also a Gaussian prime, as is seven, as is 11. So any prime that's congruent to minus one mod four is, already, is not only any rational prime, any prime in the integers, it's minus one mod four is also a prime in the Gaussian integers. But primes that are one mod four become a product of two primes in the Gaussian integers. So we can kind of, we can take, break this product up into pieces. So we can think that we have a kind of contribution over the primes that are minus one mod four, which are among these Gaussian primes. If P is minus one mod four, then negative P is, is one mod four. So actually the, although the, so here when I'm writing P, I'm thinking of positive primes. So, so, so the positive primes like three, seven, that are three mod four, they're actually bad from the Gaussian point of view. We shouldn't negate them to have this congruence condition satisfied. And so because of that, this minus, when I put in a, when I take pi to be minus p becomes a plus. And so I have this one plus p to the one minus two s. The two is coming because p times p conjugate is just p squared. So this is kind of the contribution from the Gaussian primes, from the, from the primes, from the integral primes that stay prime in the Gaussians. And then the primes to the one mod four break up as a pi times pi conjugate. And you can choose them so they're each congruent to one mod one plus i cubed. And then you get these factors, the pi factor and the pi conjugate factor. So they're the, the factors for pi and pi conjugate in the previous expression. And the pi times pi conjugate is p. So I can kind of just, instead of writing pi pi conjugate, I can just write p and I've given p. And then I can kind of multiply those two linear expressions together to get a kind of quadratic expression. And so here I've kind of put it all together. I have a product over P that's one mod four of one minus pi plus pi conjugate P to the minus S plus P to the one minus two S all inverted. And for P minus one mod four, I have something simpler. You can see they both have a P to the one minus two S. But in the first guys, I have a kind of minus pi plus pi bar. And in the second guys, I have a zero times P to the minus S. Well, I can compare that with my general formula for this L function that I had a few slides back. I had this one minus alpha times one minus beta. 
So if I kind of compare with what's happening here, I kind of see that I'm that the alpha is equal to pi and the beta is equal to pi conjugate for the prime set of one mod four and for the prime set of minus one mod four, the alpha is equal to square root of minus p and the beta is equal to negative square root of minus p. So that's kind of a special, that's just an example of how the elliptic curve thing works out in a particular case. Um, but, but the one reason I singled this out is because here, this sort of, if once we go to the Gaussian integers, there's kind of a systematic formula for alpha and a systematic formula for beta. And there's a sense in which that won't be true for more general elliptic curves. And I'll try to come back to that in the kind of automorphic part of the discussion. But I need to get there. So I need to incredibly rapidly do some class field theory. So class field theory talks about the abelianization of the GABA group of a number field. And it describes it, you can look at the Adels of the number field modulo the, uh, yeah, so what are the Adels? It's essentially a product over all the completions of K, except I take the units in all the completions of K. And then I divide by, I mean, it's not, experts will know that's not quite that, but if, it's, if you're not an expert and you don't know what the Adels are already, you should just think as a product of all the different completions of K, but I'm taking the non-zero elements. So for example, for the rational numbers, it's R, the, the non-zero real numbers cross the non-zero periodic numbers for every prime T. And I can quotient that by the diagonally embedded non-zero elements in the field itself. And that's some kind of, um, what, what that thing actually looks like, it looks like a, um, some kind of, inverse limit of some circles cross finite groups. So it looks, has some kind of solenoidal structure. It looks basically like some kind of um, five amalgamating amalgam of some kind of circles and some Cantor sets basically. And so does it has it a have quite, some suitable topology. Say again. Uh, does it have some suitable topology? Yeah, that it exactly has a natural topology, a kind of a product topology. And it's pi naught kills off the circle. The circle parts will come because, for example, if uh, you might have things like um, C star, if you had, if K, if K was true join I, then it has the complex numbers as an Archimedean completion and C star has a circle inside it. So that's how some kind of circle like factors could appear inside here. There could also be some positive real number factors, but then there'll be a bunch of Cantor set kind of factors. And when you take pi naught, you're just left with the Cantor set stuff. And the, and the Gawa group topologically looks like a Cantor set. And so this isomorphism, at least the two things on each side, at least topologically look the same. So it's at least, I don't know, conceivable that some such a statement could even have a chance to be true, because at least it's an unclaiming an isomorphism between two things that have the same nature. Um, and, so, um, and so, you know, a finite order Gawa character will be kind of a, you know, a, a character from this abelian Gawa group will be the same as kind of a finite order character of this Adele class group. Because a finite order character of this so-called Adele class group will factor through the pi naught. Um, because it'll be trivial on the connected part if it's finite order. Actually, compatible families of elliptic characters, it turns out they correspond to not necessarily finite order characters. So before I was talking about compatible families of, rep of uh, kind of compatible families of elliptic representations. And I want to think now about compatible families of elliptic characters. I wanted to talk about the abelian context first. And it turns out that a compatible family of elliptic characters can be governed by a single character on the right hand side. So this class field theory isomorphism can kind of be promoted in some slightly subtle way that I'm not going to give the details of to show that a compatible family of elliptic characters is kind of corresponds to just the character of the Adele class group, not necessarily factoring through pi naught, not necessarily finite order. And I've given you an example. So here's an example, which is I look at the case of Q. So I look at the Adele's of, so I look at this uh, Adele's of Q modulo Q star. So again, a typical element there, well, there's like a, as a product of, of a real number and a periodic number for every prime P. So to describe this character, I have to tell you kind of what happens on each factor. So each real number T is going to go to its absolute value inverted. And each prime number P is going to go to its periodic absolute value inverted, which would actually just be P. So each prime number P goes to P. The prime number P sitting in the P slot goes to P and the real numbers sitting in the real slot go to the absolute value inverse. And that altogether, that's called the absolute value 
if I didn't have all the inverses, it would be the absolute value function on this Adele class group. And since I have inverses, it's the inverse of the absolute value function. And you can see it sends this prime P in the P slot to the number P. And that's what my, that's what my fundamental class of the affine line did. That's what my inverse simple character did. It sent Frobenius at P to P. So this Adele class character matches with that inverse cyclic atomic character I had before. Here's an example for Q adjoint I. So in Adele for Q adjoint I, we'll have a complex number, that's the Archimedean completion, and it will have a kind of pyadic number for each prime pi of the Gaussian integers. So there's a kind of one plus I component, and then for each ob prime pi, there's a pi component. So the formula for this psi will have one expression at infinity, one expression at one plus i, and then a uniform expression at all the odd primes. And so that's why I've kind of broken it up, broken it up this way. So at infinity, again, you'll have an inverse, just like I did in the previous example. For the one plus i part, any, any kind of one plus i adic number is a power of one plus i to the n times a unit, times an integral unit. So I'll map that to the power of one plus i to the n. And then the unit, I'll just reduce it mod 1 plus i cubed, where it becomes either plus minus 1 or plus minus i. And I'll just remember that. So I'll kind of remember kind of the, I won't remember the whole unit, I'll just remember the way the unit looks, modulo 1 plus i cubed. And then at, um, at odd primes, I'll write an odd piatic number, a piatic number for an odd prime pi, I'll write it as a power of pi, where I, where I make that special choice of pi I made before times a unit, and I'll just remember the power of pi. So that's a formula, and you can check using unique factorization, using unique factorization of Gaussian integers, you can check it's trivial. If I take a, a Gaussian number Q, in Q and I, and I embed it diagonally, and I think about unique factorization, you'll check that it maps to one under this character. So that's kind of a formula. But the L function of that psi well, in general, if you have a character of psi, we can define the L function of psi to be the product over all the primes, at least outside a bad set, of this formula. So, so it's similar to the definition before, except that before I had a Galois representation and I took a kind of, I, I took a characteristic polynomial of a Frobenius at P. But now I have this Adele class character. I take a, well, it's a characteristic polynomial, but it's a character. So it's just a linear polynomial because it's a one dimensional representation. And I'm evaluating psi on a uniformizer in the, the p slot. I evaluate on a uniformizer at the prime p, like I would have at, 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 like I would be evaluating maybe on this pi, if, for example, in the Gaussian case. So it's a formula that's very analogous to the previous formula, but I um, instead of using Frobenius elements, which are gamma things, I'm using these uniformizers at prime p, which are Edel things. So just as a, uh, these characters are also called uh, Grossian characters. Correct. Yeah, they're called in, uh, characters or Grossian characters or Hecker characters. They're all synonymous. And the but set it, S is the set of uh, primes which divide the conductor of the... That's character? right. That's exactly right. And if you want to be, if we kind of ramp up the precision even one slight step more, the ones, the, the, the characters that, I said that these characters correspond to a kind of elatic family. Mm -hmm. So those should, they should be what are called algebraic Hecker characters, or algebraic Gaussian characters. Mm -hmm. Or Andre Bay called them type A0. I don't know if people use that terminology much anymore. They normally say algebraic. The algebraic just means that if you look at the exponents I had at the Archimedean prime at infinity, I had t to the minus one. And I mm -hmm. had z infinity to the minus one. So I didn't have a complex power. I just had an integer power. That's what algebraic means. And that's the condition that lets me convert these guys into compatible families of Galois reps. I see. So the the the, the, the Grossian characters which come from elliptic curves uh, with CM are always algebraic. Exactly. In fact, the algebraic the exponents relate to the Hodge numbers of the elliptic curves. So, so the 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 integral sort of by construction, but sort of morally, the integral because the Hodge because the, the p's and the q's that appear in Hodge theory are integers. That's the kind of philosophical reason as to why they algebraic. Thank you. I have more questions, but we can. Okay. So, um, so if you take, for example, the trivial character on the Adels, you'll just again get one minus one times p to the minus s. So you'll just get the Riemann zeta function again. It's like a third interpretation of the Riemann zeta function, of course, related to all the previous interpretations we had. 
if I put in this absolute value character, I get p times p to the minus s, and I get zero of x minus one. It's another interpretation of that cyclotomic, inverse cyclotomic L function is another interpretation of the fundamental class of A1 giving us a, an L function. And if I put in the psi I wrote down, I get the L function of that elliptic curve I had. That's how I, that's how I chose that psi for QE join I. I chose it to be, to be matching with this elliptic curve. Why does it connect to the elliptic curve? Well, the thing is, is this H1 of E, this Galois representation for the elliptic curve is an induction of this character. I was working with elliptic curve over Q. This character somehow has to do with Q adjoint I. Q adjoint I is a degree two extension of Q. So the Galois group of Q is a degree two over, I mean, it contains the Galois group of Q adjoint I with index two. So when I induce a character of Galois group of Q adjoint I to Galois group of Q, I get a two-dimensional representation. And so this is a valid formula and it kind of explains why, it explains the previous equality with the exclamation marks. And it's all, also in the kind of computation I did before where I made a shift from pi to p. I was doing a special case of what's called the induction invariance of L functions. That if you kind of L functions behave well with respect to inductions. Sorry, could you remind us what is G, G upper Q or G sub Q? So, sorry, G sub Q means the Galois group of Q, Q bar over Q. And so G that's Q the absolute, that's the absolute Galois yeah, group? Exactly. And so G Q could you say more clearly, could you say again why it's obvious this is two dimensional? Ah, because Q adjoin I is a degree two extension of Q. So if you look at Galois Q bar over Q adjoin I, that will have index two in Galois Q bar over Q. I see, so okay, good. Galois theory. So you're inducing over a little subgroup of index two. I mean, you're inducing over kind of an extension of groups of index two, so to speak. And so that's why it's two dimensional. And so the kind of, as I was saying, the manipulations before in the Euler product of kind of going between pi's and p's have a theoretical interpretation of just manipulating L functions when you have an induction. But so for general E that are not CM, this H1 of E is two-dimensional, but it's not induced from a character. It's irreducible, and in fact, it stays irreducible how, if you restrict to GK for any finite extension of K over Q. So, it, so basically it doesn't, so those L functions for those elliptic curves can't be described as Edel class character L functions. So this expression where sort of certain L functions on the Gawa side match with certain L functions on the adult side, which is part of class field theory, this is a huge deal for number theorists. I mean, this is kind of, this class field theory is a kind of culmination of investigations that begin with quadratic reciprocity. And this description of these L, of certain L functions of the Hassev A kind I was talking about in terms of these adult class characters is regarded as some vast generalization of quadratic reciprocity. And it's a kind of a, both a triumph and then sort of, you know, presents the question of what are you supposed to do? What's the kind of correct reciprocity law if you had say an elliptic curve that was not CM? So there's no, idel, there's no idyllic formalism that will describe this Gower representation. So people of course thought about this and some of the names are Shimura, Tanayama, Eichler, Ihara, Vey, Se, Sunatandaya, Birch, ultimately Wiles, Taylor Wiles, and then Roy Conrad, Diamond, Taylor. So I'm being a bit cheeky. So these last three sets of names are the people who prove the modularity theorem for elliptic curves. The first two are the people who kind of made the modularity conjecture in some form for elliptic curves. And the people in between are various kind of people who investigated questions related to this. Um, but the kind of upshot is that the L function of an elliptic curve in general is the L function of a weight two modular form. And I mean, I've kind of have more slides and time left, but I hopefully can get through something to explain that where, where in sort of the Langlands program from a number theory point of view kind of begins and comes into focus is in trying to interpret the right-hand side of this expression as being anything like the L function of a Grossman character. So, the, so in the kind of case when I had a CM elliptic curve, the analog of that LFS was this L psi S and it had an Euler product because the Edels themselves have a kind of natural product structure labeled by primes. And so if you have a character of the Edels, it's kind of natural to kind of, like it's natural to make this other product. It's not hard to imagine. It's not hard to come up with a formula. 
kind of makes a lot of sense that connects kind of with traditions in number theory. But this L function of this modular form, this modular form doesn't look anything like a character on a product group. And the L function of a modular form, if I kind of can remind you how it's normally, how we normally learn about it, at least how I kind of learned about it, is you write your modular form as a Q expansion and you do some kind of Mellon transform to replace Q to the N by N to the S. And that's how you make the L function of the modular form. So that Mellon transform isn't an Euler product, it's just some analytic process. And then if your modular form is a Hecker eigenform, you get an Euler product for the uh, Dirichlet series coming out of some of the, sort of some formulas to relate Hecker actions to Q expansions. So there's some bad stuff at the primes dividing the level and then there's kind of these quadratic Euler factors at the group primes. But the kind of second Euler product equality sort of happens after the fact and it has to do with sort of just formulas about how Hecker acts on Q expansions. So it just looks nothing like what was happening in the kind of intermediate class field theory slides. And so I want to explain how that gets fixed. So I, I want to try and explain something because I want to get to Langland's things. So I'm going to go over time. So I don't know what I should do. So I'm going to refer to the kind of hosts for advice at this point. <clears throat> well, um, I think you should keep going for a while. Maybe, I don't know, maybe aim for another 15 minutes. Sure. Okay. Great. Uh, to me. Yeah. Okay. okay. Then I'll do that. So a weight K modular form, we have, you know, everyone here, I think probably has a sense of what a weight K modular form is and has different ways of thinking about it. So I happen to learn it from Sayers course in arithmetic as a number theory student. And the way he phrases it is quite nice. He says that a weight K modular form is a function of lattices inside the complex numbers with this property that when you scale the lattice by a non-zero scalar, the value of the function is homogeneous of weight minus K. And then, you know, the, the, the picture when you think of it as a function on the upper half plane is the, the upper half plane variable tau gives you the lattice span by one and by tau. And then the usual modularity formula just comes by kind of thinking about changing basis, using an element in SL2Z to change the basis of the lattice span by one and tau. So, um, so that's what a weight K modular form is. I'm ignoring the level structure in this definition because it's not important for kind of thinking about what I'm about to say. And there's also a holomorphicity condition, which I'm also going to ignore for now. The key thing I want to say is that giving a lattice inside the complex numbers, well, if you have a lattice and you choose a basis, you're giving a basis for the complex numbers. And the complex numbers are two-dimensional real vector space. So basically giving a lattice with a choice of basis is giving a matrix in GL2R. It's giving a basis for two-dimensional real vector space. And then forgetting the basis of the lattice means you quotient that by GL2Z. And so a modular form is a function on GO2R mod GO2Z that has some transformation property under the right action of C star. Like, I mean, GO1 of the complex numbers, C star sits inside GO2R. And so, this, so it happens to satisfy some condition under the right action of C star. But again, I don't want to emphasize that. I want to emphasize that modular forms are certain functions on GO2R mod GO2Z, complex valued functions. Now that quotient GO2R mod GO2Z has a more idyllic description. It's GO2 of the Adels mod GO2Q mod GO2 of the Z hat, the kind of profinite completion of Z, the kind of integral Adels, if you like, on the right. That's the kind of basically, that equality is more or less the Chinese remainder theorem in a sophisticated, you know, in a marginally more sophisticated kind of formulation. Um, and if you think about level structures, in, from this point of view, level structures just means we think about functions on GO2A mod GO2Q, but you don't ask them to be invariant under GO2Z hat. You may be asking them to be, be invariant under some other open subgroup of GO2Z hat where you impose some uh, congruence conditions. And so ultimately, modular forms with level are just functions on GO2A mod GO2Q. They're not arbitrary functions, they're automorphic forms. They have moderate growth at infinity, they have kind of some continuity conditions and they have a kind of harmonicity condition like holomorph holomorphic implies harmonic mass forms also will be examples of automorphic forms and they are harmonic so i'm not going to say exactly what i mean by harmonicity but some that sort of pretty natural set of conditions so this is sort of automorphic forms and the hair operators at p that you see in the more traditional formulation relate to the action of geo2qp on coming from the right action of geo2qp in this idyllic formulation 
And there's kind of a theorem, and which is not so hard, but not trivial by any means, that if you have a weight k cusp form, then it will generate, an, you can think it's a vector in this, in this kind of permutation representation of GO2 of the Adels. But this, this GO2A mod GO2Q is a homogeneous space for GO2A. So there's a representation on this, on this function, on this space of automorphic forms. And F, our weight k module form is now a vector in that representation. So we can see what, repre what subgrep it generates. And so, um, what sub so there's a theorem that the um, subgrep that F generates is irreducible exactly if F is a Heck eigenform for almost all primes. Matt? Which is an eigenform <clears throat> for PP, for almost all primes. Yeah. 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 Could I interrupt for just a second? Sure. Um, I, I've really been enjoying this. Um, I think it's incredibly clear, um, particularly to a, a non-number theorist. And um, I've, I've had some expressions on chat that rather than just giving you 15 minutes and rushing through it, it would be great if you didn't have to rush and could sort of continue at the pace that you've been doing. Okay. And um, so I can think of two possibilities. One is just for you to continue now, but for longer, and the other is to do a part two um, at some point in the next several weeks or a month or something like that. Um, so I just thought it, I would ask your thoughts on that and if anybody else wants to chime in on their opinion. Ah, so I'm happy to, I'm, I'm happy to go along with anything. Um, I, I, this is Greg Moore and, and I'm voting in favor of a, a part two because I've also been enjoying this. It's been really the right level and the right pace for somebody who doesn't know much. And um, okay. there is a poll option for the hosts, Min Young and, mm -hmm. and Jeff. There is a poll option in Zoom. You can set up a little poll and ask the other 60 participants what they think. I, I think Min Young is actually the host, rather than me. At least I don't see I, that I have a poll option. Uh, yeah, I don't know I, um, how to do this poll, but I guess uh, it seems to me part two sounds reasonable to me as well, uh, unless there's some <laughs> objection to it. People can speak on it. We can do the poll that way. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I would, I would really like that because I feel like um, that's good. Sort of a slide or two back, you started to accelerate, and if yes, you could I mean, do, yes, I'm, I, yeah, I'm kind of, if yeah. you could do I'm the second that. half of your slides at the same pace as the first, yeah, and with these nice happy. examples, I, I feel like, I mean, maybe the number theorists would be bored, but I feel like people that are just tr struggling to try to understand some of this would yeah. really benefit from so that. I think it makes perfect sense. I mean, I mean, there's 20, 20 slides, so page eleven is kind of halfway that would be the natural place to begin in part two just to kind of say what i already said and then to kind of keep going um yeah so, so good why don't, why don't we plan on doing a part two and now people can ask questions and we could discuss what you've covered and and then um i'll be in touch with you about a date for a part two Does that sound okay yeah so uh, i think um mm -hmm. In particular, I th I'd be happy to, uh, I mean, already this kind of class field theory, idyllic stuff is already somehow a little more rapid on the slides even than the earlier stuff. So I'd be very happy, especially to talk about that, but also anything else that came up earlier as well, whatever people want to ask questions about. Mm, it sounds okay. good. Um, so maybe uh, as usual, we uh, naturally transition, I think, into discussion and questions and sure. anybody who needs to leave can leave when they when, when they feel like it but uh this room will be open for quite a bit quite a bit longer for questions but in the meanwhile oh sorry uh, jeff i'm interrupting you were the you were the chair today so <laughs> no no it's, it's fine i mean uh, you've been running this and i'm i'm happy to but yeah anyway thank you very much matt I've, i found that incredibly helpful and why don't i j just open it up to people who have questions or want to discuss serious sure. points so, so I have a question. I want to like to understand this um, where you are right now. This a star sub k mod yes. k star. Yes. So, what is a star sub k? This is so. This is a, a topological Lie group, or is it infinite dimensional? It's um yeah. So let's let's try and be precise about it. Um, I'm sorry, I, I don't have like even an iPad here to to start writing. So I'm going to say things just say things and hopefully people can follow. And then if you can't just ask me to repeat or we can try and find another technological solution. But let's think about the case of K equals Q. 
then what is a Q? So, so the status means we take units. We take later on, in fact, we'll think of it as doing GL1, which is the same thing, but, but we'll think of it as GL1 because you can already see in the slide that I was rushing through at the end, which shifted from GL1 to GL2. But so before we do GL anything, let's think about what the, the ring is. So, so the Adele's is a ring. It's a topological ring. And what is it? So it's almost the following thing. We take the rational numbers. We um, take each completion. So the Archimedean completion, which is the real numbers, and then also each periodic completion. And then, so the Adele's, the, the Adele's with an A is almost just the product of those completions except that you don't, there's a sub ring of that product. So instead, what you don't look at arbitrary elements in the product, you look at elements in the product, which are integers at almost all primes. That condition doesn't make sense at the really at the real numbers, because there's no notion of a real number being integral. But, in, so, but, but anyway, since it's a condition at almost all primes, you don't need to have, doesn't need to have a meaning at the real number. So you have any real component you like, and then a periodic number component for as many primes as you like, but eventually when your prime is large enough, the component should be a periodic integer. And so then the, um, then the way you can- So think those are the Edels with an I? That's the Adels with an A. So Adels ah. additive. And then the Edels- You're is, taking the invertible ones. The Edels, exactly, they're the invertible ones. That's right. They're the G, so, so the thing I just said, the Adels is a ring. So it makes sense to take the invertible elements in that ring or you know, GL1 of that ring. And that's what the star means here. That's what the Edels are. So, um, so one way to think about what the Adels are is you can first of all think, well, let's look at the kind of so-called integral Adels. So I, have, so I have an arbitrary real number and then I ask for a periodic integer at every prime p. So that's kind of, um, the real numbers cross Z2, cross Z3, cross Z5, and so on. So it's um so so that 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 product of Z2 cross Z3 cross Z5 and so on, you could also call it just the profinite completion of Z. So people often write it as Z hat. And that's a compact ring. And um and you know topologically it's kind of a Cantor set. Um and uh, and you're, you're taking the product of that with the real numbers. So you're getting a, um, well, I mean, you kind of get a topological, it's like the real numbers cross a Cantor set with this ring structure. If you put Q inside there diagonally, well, sorry, you shouldn't put Q inside there because Q had, but if you put Z inside there diagonally and you quotient out, you're doing, if you just did R mod Z, you get a circle. If you did R mod, if you, Suppose now we did R cross Z mod two, mod the diagonally embedded copy of Z. We would also get a circle, but it would be twice as wide. Like it would have double the radius. And if we did, you know, um, R cross Z mod six Z mod the diagonally embedded copy of Z, we'd also get a circle, but kind of with six times the radius. And so when you do R cross Z hat mod the diagonally embedded Z, you get an inverse limit of all those circles with increasing radius. And so, um, so it's an inverse limit of circles. So it's sort of like a universal cover of the circle, but a prof like, but not a, not the actual universal cover, which would just be the real numbers. It's sort of the inverse. It's like the profinite universal cover. It's the inverse limit of all the finite covers of the circle by itself. And so it again, it looks like um, the uh, the fiber over any point in the bottom circle will be a, will be a Cantor set. So it sort of looks like kind of locally like a Cantor set cross a circle, but of course it has a, you know, the, the, the kind of, it's not just a direct product because, because you quote, you had R cross Z hat and you were quoting out by a diagonally embedded copy of Z. But so that's kind of what, um, so if we had, um, and, and in fact, it's supposed to be obvious that the group of component. So, so that's, so, 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 anyway. first, so first of all, this is like the group of, this is the group of components in this funny topological. Yeah, so here we think the topological unit. group. Is it obvious that the group of components is abelian? Well, the so here the group is abelian. It's, an, it's a ring, and, and it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a commutative ring because it's sitting inside this product of these oh, I see. Okay, yeah, good. So, yeah, so that, so that part is kind of obvious. The connection with the right-hand side, there's, no, there's nothing obvious at all that these two should have anything to do with each other. 
But the beginning, but the beginning of how you would say they could be connected, it would be again if you thought about the case of Q, then um, so you know, so so they said the Adels, I, I was just what I was just showing you was that this Z hat has sits sort of inside the Adels. And so um and so it will turn out that, for example, this group that's written here, this Edels for if I take K to be Q, the Edels modulo Q star, that group will have a subjection onto the units in Z mod N for any N that you choose. Um, and that and, and that that subjection will, will be built out of the connection between Z hat and the Adels that I was saying before. Wait, there's some weird feedback there. Um, but then, so 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 this left hand side has a natural subjection onto Z mod N Z star for any choice of natural number N. But so does the right hand side. If you take the rational numbers and you add a primitive nth root of unity, you get a Galois extension, which is an abelian Galois extension whose Galois group is equal to Z mod N Z star. And so I, there's kind of a quotient on the left-hand side of Z mod N Z star, which is sort of more obvious and just has to do with the way Z hat has something to do with adults. And there's a quotient on the right-hand side, which is Z mod N Z star, which is less obvious, it's to do with cyclic plumbing, it's to do with Galois action on root of unity. But those, this, in the case when K equals Q, this isomorphism will, will kind of be basically built out of what I just said and taking a limit over all N. And the main thing you'll have to do to prove it is prove the chronic of Weber theorem that every abelian extension of Q is inside one of those cyclotomic extensions. So in the Thank case, you. That, that was really that was really helpful. Yeah. Um, again, in in the case of K equals Q join I, you can kind of compute the the left hand side in a similar way to instead of seeing things like Z mod N Z star, you'll see things like Z adjoin I mod N Z adjoin I star. And, uh, but, but actually, if you look at this CM elliptic curve that we had, so I have to find where I wrote it down, uh, here, if you look at, think about what the N torsion elements are in this elliptic curve, well, here, as we know that as a, you know, as a, as a, the, as a Riemann surface, we know that it's the complex numbers modulo the square lattice. Or, so the complex numbers modulo Z join I. And so the end torsion elements will just be, well, basically Z join I mod N Z join I. So, and so if you look at how the Gawa group of Q join I acts on those end torsion elements, it will act through numbers inside Z join I mod N Z join I star. And so this elliptic curve will let you make um, abelian extensions of Q join I in, the, in almost an identical way to the way roots of unity let you make abelian extensions of Q. And so, um, so this isomorphism in the case of K equals Q join I will essentially involve, um, it's uh, probably um, originally proved by Takagi in his thesis in the early 1900s. And well, one way to prove it will be you will kind of compute the left-hand side sort of explicitly, and that's not so hard using say unique factorization in the Gaussian integers. And then to connect to the right-hand side, you would on the one hand have to carefully do what I just said, kind of really study the uh, torsion points on that elliptic curve and compute the Galois theory of them precisely along the lines I was just indicating. And then you'd have to prove a version of chronic of Weber that every abelian extension of Q or join I was inside one of the extensions you got by adding torsion from that elliptic curve. And you can prove such a thing. Some of the methods you can use to prove chronic of Weber can be adapted to prove that. Um, now that you've explained that, can you explain again the relation to H1? So, so that's some, so. Uh, I mean, H1 of that, ellip yes. that elliptic curve was CM. Yeah, so essentially, uh, what I'm doing with this psi is I'm sometimes I'm kind of, I mean, not that general psi, but this particular case is I'm sort of, again, taking what I just said and um, kind of using, I don't know. So building this psi, I guess, is not, it's not literally, literally a consequence of the isomorphism from the previous slide. For example, because this psi is not factoring through the pi naught because it's non-trivial on this C star com 
on the C star component. Right, so anything that factors through pi naught will be trivial on connected components and C star is connected. So, any, so this psi is not trivial on the C star component. It kind of raises the C star component z infinity to the minus one. So it's, um, so this psi is not factoring through that pi naught. So this psi is not kind of literally a consequence of the previous isomorphism, but it's built using the same ideas of that elliptic curve. You know, it's built kind of using the same ideas. It's, I know how to build it because I know about that elliptic curve. Just like I know how to prove the isomorphism on the previous slide for Kiri John I because I know about that elliptic curve. And so um, it's kind of uh, sort of being essentially encoding the way the it's encoding the way the um, uh, Gawa elements act on the torsion in an elliptic curve, but sort of in a way that's independent of the choice of n. So before I was saying like, before when I was describing the, the class field theory isomorphism, I said that you could look at the n torsion of the elliptic curve and different choices of n and you will get different extensions of, of Q or join i. Just like if you choose different n through of unity, you get different extensions of Q. Right, and if you're kind of teaching a beginning kind of Gawa theory course, you do Q join I, and you do Q join a third unity, and Q join a fifth unity, and these are all different fields. So that's the sense in which, yeah. In fact, maybe this is a good point that the sense in which, kind of obviously, if you join different units of unity to Q, you get different field extensions. They're not the same. That's the sense in which those different elliptic cohomologies are not the same Gawa representation. Each of them. If, I, if instead of doing a elliptic cohomology, I'd done say FL cohomology, so I had finite coefficients, then each of those representations will kind of cut out an extension of Q and they will be different for different Ls just in the same way that different roots of unity give you different extensions of Q. But if you look at how Fabanius elements act on roots of unity, I wanna go back to the formula just to kind of, um, I have to figure out where I put it here. The Fabanius element of P acts on the root of unity by raising it to the P to the minus first power. And that formula doesn't depend on N. It makes this valid and makes sense as long as P is co-prime to N. So there's a sense in which there's a kind of Gower action on these roots of unity, which emits a formula independent of the N. So, so the Q adjoins Z to N is super, I mean, the, the, the field that Z to N lives in is very dependent on N. But the way Gawa acts on it has a kind of formula that's independent of N. And that's the sense in which those elliptic cohomologies are independent of L. They're not as, as the way, you know, the actual things they are is very dependent on L. The, the um, for example, the kernel of the Gawa representation on them, the kernel of the Gawa action on that elliptic cohomology is super dependent on the choice of L. But the formula for how the Pete Fabinius element acts is independent of L. Just like here, you can see that the formula is independent of the choice of N. And so that's what this psi down here is doing. It's kind of, I'm, I'm extracting the way that Fabinius elements in Q, for G of Q and I act on the torsion on the elliptic curve and I'm kind of extracting the expression for that in a way that doesn't mention what particular N torsion I'm acting on. I mean, and again, maybe not obviously so because like, I haven't, you know, spelled out the whole, haven't spelled it all out quite as explicitly or even at all as explicitly as I did for the root of unity case. But that's kind of what's happening. I don't know if that makes any sense. It makes a little sense. What's, but, but what about the relation to H1? Could you? Then, okay, so, then what's, happening, yeah, so then what's happening for H1 is that what I've written down is a character of the uh, Idels. And then by this kind of fact that I claim that I made, that this not necessarily final order character that I've written down gives me a kind of compatible family of elliptic characters, I'm really getting a compatible family of one dimensional representations of the Gawa group of Q join I. So I can induce them up to get a two dimensional representation of GQ. And so then I have two or really a compatible family of elliptic representations of GQ of dimension two. I have, that's, this, that's the right hand side. The left-hand side is some other compatible family that I, I know exists. And I'm saying that they're equal. And I know that, well, because I kind of wrote down essentially the, yeah, what, I mean, I guess what I, sorry, what I should have said, but didn't say is that, I'm sorry, I should have. Yeah, yeah. 
make a point. Maybe it's helpful, but uh, is it true that the Galois representation on the cohomology of an elliptic curve with CM is abelian? It's, well, almost, and I'll come back to that in just a sec. Okay. But yes, that's very close. That's very close to what this induction statement means. So okay. literally what's true is the statement with the induction, but it's very close to what you just said. Um, but I just wanted to say that there's a, there's a point I should have made and didn't make is that these characters match with these compatible families. And for compatible families of Gawa representations, we had defined an L function sort of on a previous slide, probably like uh, here. I said how, it, so that's kind of a formula for how to make a L function out of a compatible family of realistic representations. And now here, I've written down a formula for how to make an L function out of a out of an Adele class character. And here I've said that Adele class characters correspond to compatible families of Galactic Gala characters. So what I should have said is that also that correspondence makes the L functions match. And so the kind of Galois theoretic L function for uh, H1 of E will be the same as a Galois theoretic L function for this right hand side Galois representation, which will be the same as the Galois theoretic L function for the character psi itself, which will be the same as the Adelic L function. And the Adelic L function is what I've written down there. And I kind of wrote down the Galois theoretic L function of the elliptic curve uh, here. And, and they're the same. I mean, they're just the same formula. So that's kind of, that's kind of the, so I guess I'm maybe didn't literally. The equality of the L, I mean, this is a, this is an, this is an isomorphism of, yeah. of representations yes. of GQ. Yes, but one and way you uh, could think about that, it is. That, the fact that you have such an isomorphism doesn't follow from the equality of L. But, 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 but let me argue that it does because it turns out these Fabinius elements are dense in this topological Galois group. And so that's it's called Charotar of density. Oh, I see. Okay. And so then that means that, you know, to check these things are the same, you have to check, for example, they have the same trace of Fabinius for all primes P. And those traces of Fabinius you can extract from the L functions, from the Euler factors. So in fact, the equality of L functions is enough to get this isomorphism. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so that's, yeah, I'm sorry, there's, of course, yeah, layer upon layer of kind of technicality that I, yeah, have been sort of suppressing maybe for clarity or maybe for lack of clarity. But, but just to address the abelian statement, what will be true is that if you look at the formula I've written, so that's an isomorphism of G Q representations. Let's just strict to G of Q or join I. On the left hand side, I get G of Q or join I. On the right hand side, I get I've I abstractly I have a sub I have a group G, that would be GQ. I have a subgroup H of index two. I have a character of H. I induce mm -hmm. up to G from H, then I restrict back to H. So I, so that becomes a sum of two characters. Right. So on Q adjoint, for G Q adjoint I, this will be abelian. Right. What that's related to is that if I go back to the formula for the complex multiplication, if I do Gower automorphisms that preserve I, they'll be compatible with the complex multiplication. I so what looks like a two-dimensional representation on a Z module or on a QL module will look like a one-dimensional representation on a kind of QL or join I module. But, oh, but, but the elements in GQ don't commute with this I. So the elements in GQ don't commute with the CMs. And so I, I don't get to think of them as acting secretly on a one-dimensional vector space. The elements of GQ are really acting on a, like there's, I guess what I'm saying is that on the cohomology, for the GQ of join I action cohomology is commuting with this extra endomorphism. And so the, the, the kind of cohomology, which you think of as being two dimensional, is really one dimensional over the CM field. Uh -huh. so and that's where, the, so that's where the character design comes from. So, I can, uh, so, this, so, this, so the following statement is true that the action of the Frobenius on the cohomology commutes with the action of a uh, ring of endomorphisms of the curve? Yes, if you understand that to be Fabinius elements for Gaussian primes in GQ or join I, then that's true. Right, okay. And uh, this generalizes to any um, 
elliptic curve which has cm over any uh, imaginary quadratic field yes the only the only thing is that in general if you if the quadratic imaginary field has class number bigger than one uh -huh. then that elliptic curve won't be defined over q or over that cm field it'll be only be defined over a larger field but, right so and then but it'll be true once you kind of get the correct field of definition the analogous name it'll be true right right okay thank you yeah so that's um yeah so so sort of the so the theory of this class field theory isomorphism, when k is a quadratic imaginary field, one approach to studying it is via kind of CM elliptic, you know, CM elliptic curves. Although um, I don't know myself how to kind of prove this in the even even in the quadratic, quadratic imaginary case. Like for Q or John I, I could prove it kind of directly. Like I could prove quadratic of Weber directly. In general, for other more general quadratic imaginary fields, especially ones with class number bigger than one. I'm not sure that people really know how to prove this statement using CM elliptic curves without proving it abstractly as well, and then using it as an input to help study the, the theory of CM elliptic curves. Um, and then for other K, for example, for K being a Q joiner square root of a positive number. Mm -hmm. Oh, for real quadratics? Yeah, then people, you know, then this is kind of very non-explicit and people don't I mean, of course, it's for theorem, but I think in uh, one of his kind of exposés on it, Tate says that once you finish reading the proof, you come to the conclusion that the theorem is true for the reason that it couldn't be otherwise, and that's all, which I take into mean, well, okay, at the end, there's a logical proof, so it's true, but that's about all I can say. <laughs> like it's sort of hard to understand in some sense why it's true, because like in, in the QA join I case, we can at least build matching objects on each side or in the q case you can using um roots of unity you can kind of build you can sort of see how the two sides are supposed to match mm -hmm. but sort of for the for, or if you did say q rejoin square root of two or q rejoin square root of five the right hand side is actually tricky to understand uh, sorry the left hand side is actually tricky to understand in that case and it's related to the fact that they're infinite order units the solutions to Pell's equations give you unit integral units of infinite order in real quadratic fields and they mm -hmm. make the left hand side tricky to compute uh, much harder than in the quadratic imaginary case. And then the right hand side, people don't know how to kind of describe that explicitly either. They just somehow know that the two sides, both of which are somehow difficult to describe explicitly, match. Mm -hmm. And that's a general feature of the Langlands program going as it goes on is that it's kind of like this two sides, a kind of Diophantine side and, a, and an automorphic side, and they kind of correspond. But there's not really a sense in which one side is more elementary than the other. There's not really a sense in which you're trying to use this to move information from a preferred side to a more difficult side or vice versa. Both sides are pretty enigmatic. So it's more like phenomena on one side manifests differently on the other side until you can kind of, you know, some phenomena might be more transparent on one side than on the other side, but even that's not always true. Like a phenomena like the Vey conjectures on the Diophantine side relate to what's called the Ramanujic and Peterson conjecture on the automorphic side. And, mm -hmm. um, and they're, they're kind of ways of thinking about them on each side separately of the Langlands correspondence and ways of thinking about them via the Langlands correspondence. And all those ways of thinking are all rich and interesting and have a kind of big tradition. And none of them is especially preferable to the other. It's mm -hmm. kind of, it says the two sides are super complicated and rich and the connection between them enriches both sides. Yeah. Matt, I have a kind of lowbrow question Okay. Um, you, on an earlier slide, you wrote Z um, as a product of zeta functions divided by an L function. Yes. And you said the zeta functions came from H0 and H2 and yes. the L function from H1. Yes. So that's kind of reminiscent of an Euler characteristic. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is that, is, is that, a way, can I interpret? Is, yeah, is there I, some... I think if you look at the kind of, I mean, if you look at the formula for the, like the alternating product, you have this kind of, the term coming from the cohomology is kind of raised to a power alternating uh, uh, degree. So it, so it is kind of, and, and if you think about how you, how that relates to kind of a left -right fixed point count, you can see that, it, yes, it's not coincidence that it matches with, with an other characteristic. It's yeah, okay. like characteristic left shed's kind of formalism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Is okay. in there? Yeah. Good. Can I ask a question? It's, it's even more lowbrow. Um, Great. Um, in the first few pages in the development, you always have these products with over primes, which do not divide some, some n. Yes. Some, some bad. So in the example you gave, what is this n? Is it related to this even prime that you left on? Yeah, so in, um, yeah, so, uh, so in fact, 
in in those in those the cases I wrote down. So like in the Riemann zeta function, the kind of there's no bad n. You have every prime, and in this um, in general in in this in this uh, formula, I kind of left out the prime uh, one plus i this even mm -hmm. prime. But in fact, also with that prime, the, there'd be no Euler factor actually. The Euler factor would just be one. So I didn't actually leave anything out. Although I, you have to kind of do something to see that you should, you should have to do something to check that that was okay. Um, so in, in fact, in general, in these. Um, so given this equation, could you have said a priori that, that there is no such end? Yeah, so, so what, you, what you could see is that um, it's related to the fact that this elliptic curve has bad deduction at the prime two. If you compute the discriminant, it'll be a power of two. And so, um, and that, and it, but it also is, but the kind of thing you have to check is that that's something intrinsic. You have to check that it wasn't a bad choice of, you have to check there's not a change of variables, for example, that would actually mm -hmm. make it have good deduction at two. So that's, in that case, it's not so hard to check, but it's not completely obvious. But it, so in general, if you look at these, L, in the case of a character, so people talk about these Euler products in terms of having kind of a degree. So they think of this as being a degree one Euler product because you just have kind of a single linear expression in the norm of the prime to the minus s. And you, I want to contrast, so, so that degree one Euler product, like, so here's, a, here's an example again of a degree one Euler product. It looks like um, a degree two Euler product if I write it in terms of rational primes, because now I have kind of a, quadratic polynomials in p to the minus s. The fact that a degree one Euler product for one field can look like a degree two for another is related to this induction formalism I had before, that the two-dimensional representation for q can be the induction of a one-dimensional representation for q adjoint i. But if you, but so people think, so the idea is that at the bad primes, you would have Euler factors, but there'll be lower degree. Mm -hmm. So if the degree, if the kind of good degree is one, then lower degree is zero. And so that means that at the bad primes in these, abelian L functions, there are no extra mm -hmm. factors, but you have to make sure you have the right set of bad primes. So anybody who studied the proof of Dirichlet's theorem on primes in arithmetic progression, and has, if you've ever looked at that argument, people talk about Dirichlet characters, and then they have a whole discussion of what a primitive Dirichlet character is, and you should really work with primitive Dirichlet characters. That's a, that discussion of primitive Dirichlet characters is about identifying exactly what the bad S is in the definition of a Dirichlet L function. So, um, so if, if you want, for example, to have a correct functional equation and analytic continuation, you better pin down exactly the correct Euler factors at all primes. Otherwise, you know, because if you have a zeta function that does have a functional equation, and then you modify the Euler factor at five, there's no way the modified guy can have a nice functional equation mm -hmm. because the Euler factors don't satisfy anything like a functional equation of that kind. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so for example, in the theory of Dirichlet-L functions that's used in the, you know, in Dirichlet theorem primes in arithmetic progressions, if you want those Dirichlet-L functions to have the precise functional equations, you have to really pin down the bad primes, and that's why people work with primitive Dirichlet characters. So that's kind of a, the most elementary context that you could have seen a battle over bad primes. So the primitive Dirichlet character just essentially means that um, it's not a pullback of a character on some smaller group, say. Exactly. Even. And, and, yeah, it means that the period isn't secretly lower than the period. You, you think of it as a sort of a character of period eight, and it's not secretly a period four. Right. So what does that have to do with bad primes? Or well, so if you were kind of, you know, well, if you kind of wrote down a Dirichlet character. Yeah, or 12, that's a conductor of that Dirichlet character. Yeah, yeah. if you wrote down a Dirichlet character in mod 12, but it was actually secretly had period three then you should include an Euler factor at the prime two. You uh -huh. would have to kind of recognize that this chi really made sense as a mod three character, not just a mod 12 character. So you knew what to do with the prime two. I see. So that's not a very complicated thing in that case, but yeah. in, more general, in more general diaphragmatic context, you're sort of, as like, you know, related to, can you make a change of variables that gives this variety better reduction modulus and bad prime than you thought it had. And it's related to why, you know, of course, Greg's comment at the very beginning that I could scale the variables is a com completely correct comment, but mm -hmm. uh, that, I, that, I, that I could scale the equations to get rid of this denominator. But when you try, try and think about what, what primes are bad, when a thing's singular or not, of course, this kind of scaling and change of variables is exactly the issue. And so sort of you know, clearing denominators or not at this kind of stage doesn't really affect the question later on of identifying exactly which primes are bad, because it's not so much whether the reduction exists or not. We can always scale the equations to make the reduction exists exist. It's whether the reduction is like a, a smooth variety mod P or not. 
and right. that's a subtle question that can be hard. I mean, like for example, in sort of in in practice, whereby in practice I mean in you know the practice of theoretical number theory, one way people would recognize intrinsically bad primes will be via some ramified gala action. Well, the decomposition group or the inertia group is uh, non. Yeah, they would recognize. They would look for non-trivial action of the inertia group exactly. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So uh, to continue with the Greg's thing, because this space does is a little scary to get into, although you made it really, really nice, the Adelic space. Uh, okay, how, yeah, sure. I wanted to understand how do the Hecke operators act on here? So in this context? Yeah. So uh, let's so just one is naive and know how the Hecke operators yeah, act. So, on so let's figure out, first of all, let's think what are the bad primes for one of these psi's? So let me look at my formula. So I guess I didn't say it here, but I should have said it was kind of implicit. But this this character, I told you what to do on a on a real number, and I told you what to do on the prime p sitting at the kind of sl the p-adic slot. Mm -hmm. but of course, there are many more p-adic numbers than just p and its powers. But any p-adic number is a is an integral unit times a power of p. And what I should have said is that on the integral units, you just send them to one. So. So the, the bad primes will be the primes where the character is non-trivial on the integral units. So this character has no bad primes. On all integral units at all chaotic slots, it's just trivial. So I it see. has no bad primes. And that's why the Euler product for the Riemann zeta function or for this function has no bad primes in, that we emit. But if I look at this one, the units at one plus i play a role, but at the other primes, they don't play a role. So here one plus i is a bad prime. And so, um, okay, so what's happening is that if we fix a set of bad primes, then we're looking at characters which are really, um, at all the good primes, they're invariant when you multiply by a unit. So they don't, so at the good primes, you're not really seeing a character in all of QP star, you're just sort of seeing a character on the powers of P. Mm -hmm. And so the Hecker operator will be just multiplying by P. Mm -hmm. You would take it, so you would think of a, you would kind of think that you're doing, so the analog of automobile forms, you, you, you would think you're doing something like L2, maybe, yeah. or, or some, some function space on this abelian group. Then these characters are kind of the irreducible constituents of that function space. Right. So I'm doing kind of abelian Fourier theory. Yeah. And then the Hecker operators would just be, I multiply by, if I, you know, I can translate a function by this by the prime p sitting at the pth slot, and right. that will kind of multiply it. But if I do that to a character, I'll just multiply the character by its value at p. So essentially, the the Hecker eigenvalues will just be the values of the character at the good uniformizers at the good primes p. I see. And that, and and so those Hecker eigenvalues are kind of what's appearing essentially in this definition of the old product of I the old function. I see. I see. So um, I. But I guess what's going to happen in in, non, in the non-abelian context, yeah, you know, it's not as simple as kind of having the Hecker operators aren't going to be a a group act. They're not going to be group elements anymore. It's kind of, in fact, it's not really on my slides, but we can definitely talk about it, sort of exactly as I, very I, obvious. So I had this other thing in mind. You you'd written down that uh, the Hecker operators correspond to GL two QP action. I just wanted yes. to. That's well, that's right. But I guess so. Here, what I've said is the Hecker operators correspond to the QP star action, but but at, at primes where ZP star is kind of trivial for the character, right? So, so the analog in the GL2 case will be you look at you, you look at a prime P which is not in the level of your modular form, so your modular form is fixed under GL2 ZP. So, you're looking at primes P where you're taking, you're, you're taking a modular form. So it's fixed as P doesn't divide the level. So it's fixed by GL2 ZP. And so, but you can still act GL2 QP on it. Mm -hmm. So now if GL2 ZP were normal in GL2 QP, you could kind of act, the, the, there'd be a quotient group you could act and you could try to measure something about that. But of course, GL2 ZP is not a normal subgroup of GL2 QP. So when you, for mm -hmm. example, so for example, the fixed, this fixed space, this fixed space for the GL2 ZP that your modular form F is lying in, won't even be preserved by GL2 QP. Like when you act an element of GL2 QP, you'll move out of that fixed space for GL2 ZP. Right, 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 right. But you can always, but now you use the kind of the pro-finiteness of the group. So, um, 
you know, if you, if you, the abstract setup will be, I have a subgroup H of a group G and G is acting on a vector space. And I'm taking a vector V fixed by H and I act an element in G. Now, again, if H were normal in G, then the fixed space for H would have an action of the quotient G mod H. But, let, but we're in a case where H is not normal in G. So what happens? I have a fixed vector for H. I act an element little G on it. I land in the fixed space for G conjugate of H. Yeah? Right. But in our context, in these chaotic groups, if you conjugate G or 2ZP by something and you intersect with G or 2ZP, the intersection will have finite index. I see. So I can, so I can average back over the cosets and land back up in the fixed space for G or 2ZP. I see. I see. Great. Two is... steps, I translate, then I average. In yeah. the abelian normal context, I don't have to do the averaging because it, because everything is normal in abelian groups. But in general, I have to like, and that's what a heck operator is. A heck operator is exactly. Right. Exactly. exactly. Now it, yes, now it, okay. I prefer this a lot now because, I mean, uh, if you think of a uh, class, well, heck operators in the sense of being double coset operators. Yes, that's exactly what, yeah, exactly. if you want to wrap what I said, that's what you're going to get. Right. Awesome. Thank so, you. Um, but, but yeah, but sort of the, so in the abelian case, the heck action is just a group action because you don't have to do any averaging step. But in general, right. in the abelian case, there's an extra averaging step. And so it's, so these heck algebra, they look a bit like a group algebra, but they're not literally a kind of group action or a group algebra. Right. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. So, okay. Since nobody else is asking, I'll go on. Um, sure. So you're talking about, uh, so, so, so you get representations of the absolute Galois group on an elatic space. Yes. Uh, and you construct an L function out of it. Are, uh, uh, are representations of ga absolute Galois group on, let's say, GLNC, so over a complex space, uh, interesting? So they sure. would be... Uh, yeah, yes. They'll be... So they'll have finite image. Right. The topologies are so different. Right. And so that means that you'll be able to kind of conjugate them to land inside GLN Q bar. Uh, can you repeat that, please, the last? Well, well since they'll secretly be factoring, they'll be sort of factoring through finite image, right? So any yep. complex shape of a finite group, the character actually has algebraic integer values. And so you can actually conjugate them to be defined over the over Q bar, over the algebraic numbers. Yeah, yeah. So that means that this the complex representation you have in mind mm -hmm. is actually sitting inside GLN QL for every L. Right. Or GLN, GLN QL bar for every L choice of L because it's actually in GLN Q bar. So okay. it's the kind of compatible family, which is super duper compatible because actually now they're really coinciding for every L. But that's in some sense a unique way that you could really make these different analytic representations genuinely coincide for every L is that they would actually be landing inside GLN Q bar. So that doesn't happen for the general, like for the, say for the H1 of elliptic curves, there's no, these, although the Trebanius elements have, um, Although their traces are algebraic numbers, mm -hmm. there's no sense in which the actual whole elliptic representation is landing inside GL2 of Q bar. It's really landing inside GL2 QL and using it, it's really taking advantage of elliptic numbers for each L, and those are different for different L's. But the Fabanius elements somehow magically have a char poly, which has got you know algebraic even integer coefficients. Um, but for these guys we're talking about now, they're the very special case where when the image is finite. It's actually going to land inside GLNQ bar, and then it's inside GLNQ or inside GLNQL bar for every L in a very manifest way, and they're compatible in a maximally compatible way, which is that they all the same representation as L changes. So those, the, so those special, so they're the ones, as I said, that will correspond to zero-dimensional representations. Uh, sorry, zero-dimensional varieties, but which are kind of interesting over Q because they, that's like number fields. And so, um, so they're called Artin representations. And those, the L functions for those are called Artin L functions. He was probably the first one who had this Fabanius kind of Euler product formalism for making L functions. I think it's due to him. And, um, and so these, and, and, and then Lenglen's for Artin L functions is very interesting. In fact, the very last thing on my slides on page, the bottom of page 20 is about that case. So they're, they're very interesting. Um, they're in a way they're a little more difficult. So for example, the modularity theorem for elliptic curves was proved before. So if you take uh, two dimensional representations of GQ and you have to make a certain parity assumption that's very important, but I'm not gonna go into it now, then, then the kind of modularity of those Artenel functions is also proved. They correspond to weight one modular forms. 
Oh, wow. But that theorem, that theorem was proved later. I mean, by the same circle of people, it's the same circle of researchers who, who study elliptic curves and study these icon reps and so on. But in, and it, it's technically a little bit harder. Weight one modular forms are somehow technically harder to access than weight two modular forms, actually. So although finite image is simpler kind of representation theoretically, it's actually some, and it's simpler kind of to think about if you're a beginner because you don't have to have this L changing. You don't have to sort of think about this varying L. It's actually technically harder. Uh -huh. um, I guess the technical reason it's harder, although it's not obvious why this is relevant, is that um, if you have a two-dimensional representation coming from you know, an elliptic curve, the Hodge number is a zero, like there's a zero one and a one zero in the Hodge diamond. And so each right. point in the Hodge diamond is one dimensional and there are two different points in the Hodge diamond. Whereas if you had sort of something two dimensional coming from a zero dimensional variety, maybe like geometrically, it would just be a pair of points. The Hodge diamond is just sitting at zero, zero with dimension two. So you have a repeated multiplicity in one point of the Hodge diamond. And it turns out that kind of studying modularity theorems or Langlands theorems when you have multiplicities in the Hodge diamond is technically much harder than when you have no multiplicities in the Hodge diamond. For, for kind of for reasons related to the, the methods that people use to prove these kind of theorems. So that so, so what is the statement? I, so the statement to make sure I understand this. Yeah, so if you take a two dimensional continuous, yeah, take a two dimensional representation of GQ into into G, into over C. So a continuous map from GQ to G to C. You have to make a parity mm -hmm. assumption. You have to assume that. So what that means is you look at the image of complex conjugation. Which is, you know, complex conjugation is, a, is an element of Galois group of Q of order two. So under this representation, right. the image has to be a matrix of order two. So up to conjugation, it's either going to be the identity, negative of the identity, or one, zero, zero, minus one. Right. The so that, that, that last case is called odd. The first two cases are called even. Okay. So you need it to be, so it should be odd. So if you have a two dimensional odd R to representation of GQ, it arises from a weight one modular form. So it's L, the, the R10L function will be the same as the L function of a weight one modular form. Mm -hmm. And so for, um, for, for r 10 representations that are induced from- Oh, so, wait, okay, sorry. So, and the same thing is true that the conductor of the representation is uh, the level. Yes. Yep. So, yeah, so for, for, char for, for two-dimensional reps that are induced from characters, uh, that's due to, um, Hecker and Mass, I guess, and for um, uh, and for two-dimensional representations whose projective image is is uh, solvable, so like a tetrahedron group or an or a S, you know, an octa uh, octahedron group, it's due to Langlands actually and Tunnel. But for the in some sense the most difficult cases, if the if the projective image of the two-dimensional rep is the icosahedral group, uh -huh. so the non-solvable case. So that's due to, um, uh, ultimately due to, I guess, Kari and Ventabage, but it's kind of first studied by Taylor and Richard Taylor and collaborators. And so it's sort of due to the, to the kind of pe people in the late 20th, early 21st century who were kind of working in all these modularity theorems. Mm -hmm. nice um, and there's no, uh, is there any motivic interpretation of uh, weight one forms? Uh, it's not so direct because they um they don't connect to atel cohomology, so right. that, that's one reason why this case is harder to study. But Deline and Say actually prove that every weight one form does give one of these Arthur representations by a very fascinating proof, which is uses higher weight modular forms and hence that motivic point of view as an input, but then does more. And so mm -hmm. in that argument, so it's a it's this paper of Deline and Say, and it's it's a super interesting argument. The um. For example, the, they construct the image elatically and they don't know it's finite. And then to show it's finite, they use some kind of Archimedean estimates of the, um, co of the Q expansion coefficients of the modular form. And so it's a very interesting mix of kind of automorphic, analytic, and uh, kind of elatic technique. Uh, just as a, you know what, uh, I think Dodzaghi explained it to me and it he said that, uh, how did they, every unitary, every unitary theta series is a weight one uh, modular form? Mm -hmm. is, is it really, I mean, is, 
Uh, the t- <laughs> because the two arguments are such different uh, kinds of worlds that the so one yes, that- so, yes, so somehow, if you want to start, for example, if you study in the case of two-dimensional reps that are induced, is, is related to studying theta series and uh, and that's sort of, that that perspective is, is you know, the theta series perspective connects, at least as far as I understand it, connects to the induced case. And that's a good way to understand that case. But the, um, but if, but if you take something, if you take a kind of A5 extension of Q, where the theorem applies, the weight one module form won't be built out of theta series. And if I handed you that weight one form, it wouldn't be so obvious how to make the Galois representation. You'd really have to go through the whole Dillian say argument. And if I hand you the, and if I hand you the, um, the you know, if instead I handed you the Galois representation, which will be explicitly basically handing you a quintic polynomial. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you would you wouldn't sort of have a way to construct the modular form other than you could sort of start using this quintic polynomial to kind of compute the q expansion coefficients of the modular form by running the l series formula backwards and then you could try and look at a table and discover oh shit like the tables of weight one modular forms actually contain this q expansion that i'm generating prime by prime yeah yeah don loves these kinds of proofs comparing yeah. to a table so this is yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I, uh, one God. last thing I'd have to go, I'm being summoned, but uh, this is, I mean, this is more philosophical and this is uh, in uh, relation to the comments that I think uh, Greg and uh, Jeff Harvey made about uh, how to incorporate uh, electric cohomology in physics. Yes. Um, as far as electric cohomology is concerned, one can, I mean, Grothendieck's original idea was to see um, maps from so for example if you're looking at a lattice cohomology of a curve you would want to consider maps from uh, all the um, fine well all galois coverings of the curve into um, this curve yes um so if if one takes this viewpoint some i mean one can try to say something that your physics is living on the original curve and then somehow what are its remnants on these uh, finite coverings as in you'd have to consider your Hamiltonian and your physics on these finite coverings somehow. So uh, this is just very philosophical, but uh, <clears throat> uh, what I wanted to ask was that I, is it, I mean, how does one think of Elaric uh, cohomology in terms of uh, finite et al covers of uh, the original? Yeah. Well, so one thing is that um, to, in, to find analytic cohomology in general, you have to look beyond finite et al covers. Mm-hmm. Okay. So finite et al covers will kind of let you see the um, et al pi one, but if your space is not a k pi one, yeah, which your most high dimensional varieties are not going to are be, not right, right, right. Then you can't expect to just use the information in the in the pi one to compute the cohomology, and so this is why there's a distinction between a kind of et al cover which is an atal morphism, which is also a finite morphism and a more general notion of atal morphism where you don't impose finiteness. And so you have to use covers by more general atal. You, so you, you kind of look at the, so the atal topology in general is defined by just looking at atal morphisms that aren't required to be finite. And then you do the growth and kind of topology machine. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of how you compute the elastic cohomology. Um, I mean, I don't know if, if that makes sense. If, like, I'm kind of talking about, I guess, a kind of stand, something that's on the one hand standard. On the other hand, I don't want to presume what's standard here. So is what I'm saying kind of makes sense? Is it something that's... Um, of, anyway, anyway, I'd say that if, if, you well, kind of, if you look at the definition of the ATAL topology and you want to think about, like, what should you take away? I think yeah. one thing is, like, at a ten- level is, it, is using non-finite ATAL covers, using arbitrary ATAL covers. Yeah, that okay. gives kind of flexibility. Like that's, for example, the, the way that can give flexibility is, for example, if you want to do things like have six operations, you'll want to do things like have a closed embedding of one variety into another, and you'll want to be able to like push forward sheets or pull them back. Yeah. So you'll need to be able to compare open neighborhoods. So, so that will mean that, for example, if you had a closed sub variety of a variety and you had an ATAL cover of a closed sub variety, you want to be able to spread you know, an ATAL open set, much of a closed sub variety, perhaps even an ATAL cover you could start with. You want to be able to spread it out to something over the bigger variety. Mm-hmm. But if you try to spread it out and make it finite over the bigger variety, there might be branching because you just couldn't, you know, like that's because it's 
like imagine you took a branched cover of a surface right and then you chose a curve that was kind of disjoint from the branch locus right then that branch cover would restrict to an atel cover of the curve right and 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 then if you deleted the branch locus upstairs yeah that would be an atel morphism to the surface that was kind of a extending the atel cover of the of the curve but you right. couldn't put that out to a finite atel cover because if you try to make it finite over the surface if you try to really complete it you'd have to put back in the branch locus and that would stop the atelness going on and so you kind of so for example even in like studying how the atel topology behaves when you pass the closed subsets you use the advantage that you're allowed to look at these atel morph these atel maps that are not finite essentially it means you have to you have like it means that if you kind of close them up there'll be finite morphisms that have branching but the branching has been deleted and so you're looking at an atel morphism that's not finite so you're kind of allowing yourself to basically work with those kind of atel morphisms as well I that's, see. Okay. Technic that's sort of technically kind of crucial i guess um so that's the definition of an atel morphism which is not fi finite that's yeah yeah i mean there's quite an there's an intrinsic definition and you know depending on what generality you're working in of various equivalences can break but at least you know over varieties you can think that an atel morphism will be sort of take a finite morphism delete the branch locus upstairs in the domain and what's left is an atel morphism this Oh. And the finite atel covers are the things you got like this where you didn't have to delete any branch locus, where the branch locus was empty. Okay. Right, and to compute, the, to compute the pi one, you don't need the first guys, you only need the second guys, but to compute the atel cohomology, you need the second guys. And again, you could think that it's philosophically, it's related to the fact that if varieties are not a k pi one, you shouldn't expect just the kind of data that pi one is connected to to compute the higher cohomology. You need to sort of see something, something more. So these kind of atel maps that are not finite are kind of seeing more of the um, they're seeing the parts of the topology of the variety that's not just encoded in its pi one. Mm. Mm. Okay, so that's the k pi. Okay. Um, yeah. That's so, not good. Yeah. So pro probably like at a technical level, the first time you would see this kind of uh, this this flexibility being used will be in studying kind of how the atel topology behaves and you have a closed embedding that's kind of technically where this kind of you know this generalization will come into play but it's somehow philosophically i think super important from the beginning i think um i think Sarah thought about versions of trying to compute atel cohomology but with um just covers and he couldn't really get beyond local systems ah. because of you know he couldn't he somehow couldn't really you know, exactly because he was locking himself into stuff that had to do with pi one. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. So I, I think it was, yeah. it was kind of an insight of growth indeed to kind of relax that condition. Yeah. I did not know that that's actually really deep that these things were seeing uh, homotopy groups in. Uh, and that's what it was. Yeah. I, I, get, I mean, like another way to think about it will be that, you know, if you wanted to compute the topology classically, you'd have, to, you could use check open covers, but then you definitely have to use proper open sets. If you don't, I mean, you have to let yourself use, you know, so you can't just use like a, an open cover that's also a finite morphism has to just be an isomorphism. Like, so, so check covers are using kind of open maps that are not finite. And mm -hmm. so, um, so in some sense, like this notion of a tile that I'm talked about is kind of basically the kind of minimal kind of generalization of simultaneously a finite atom morphism and an open immersion. And so it's kind of, you know, so it kind of has a check aspect to it that, that the um, finite atom covers don't have. Nice. Thank you. That was great. Oh, you're welcome. So by the way, in your, uh, so I read through your notes being a good student, I guess, before the class. But uh, there was nothing about the Arthur. Uh, uh, I know. Well, stuff. because I was writing them, and then I got to twenty pages, and like, okay, I was just never going to get to. <laughs> so we'll see if in part two there's enough time to get to Arthur now that there's a second part. Okay, then I'll wait for that because I mean, in that case where you're looking at L two modular forms, there's uh, these really nice things coming from uh, Zellberg, the Zellberg Grace formula, and uh, yes, yes, uh, so that whole, yeah, exactly that whole story, and then the Arthur SL two comes into play. Right. And um, and it's the connection with L two is in some way at least philosophically related to the fact that you could use L two cohomology to compute Hodge theories on 
the Hodge oh, and things like this. So there's a whole kind of story there. And because uh, SL2 also kind of is connected in a way to mirror symmetry, I think it's kind of interesting to talk about. Right. That was in your abstract. That sounded really, yes. really interesting. So I hope that we'll, yeah. So, I mean, I can always add, I mean, there's more pages are free. I mean, time is not free to talk about them, but you know, the pages are kind of fairly free. So I can try to write a little more about that and append them to the notes and then hopefully try to get to them or anyway, at least they'll be in the notes. So I'll see mm -hmm. if I can do that before next time. Yeah, I would thank you so much. That's uh, super nice. But uh, okay, so, and and seriously, the last question. So, um, this Adelic space does have a Laplacian as well that you can actually make sense of harmonic forms. Um, well, the the Laplacian it will be what I mean is so it has you know it has we talked about GO two QP acting on it and giving heck operators. It has GO two R acting on it. Yeah. So it has a Casimir. Right. So it's a Laplacian. Right. And that gives, okay. So that's what I mean. So with, by harmonicity, I mean that you should be an eigenvector or maybe a generalized eigenvector under the Casimir. Under the Casimir. And under the higher, if we were doing GLN under the higher, or, or doing a general group under the higher Casimirs too. Okay. Okay, thank you. So I, would, I would have gone on uh, speaking for hours, but I'm being summoned. I'm so, I, yeah. it's a shame, but I'll catch you next week, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. I really appreciate Bye -bye. it. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. So I don't know if there are any other questions for the dialogue. I have a, I have a quick question. Um, so very early on in your very early on in your talk, you said um, you said that these um, Hasse-Weil zeta functions are a bit like, like these dynamical zeta functions. Yes, yes. Is that anything more than an analogy, or could you, for example, say, given some elliptic curve with some zeta function, construct some dynamical system that gives you the same zeta function? I think, um, you know, I, I think, I mean, it's more than an, an analogy, but it's, I think, less than, maybe slightly less than what you just said. So, um, that you, um, so the Philatic cohomology, I mean, as was like the backdrop to the discussion that was just being had, is some elaborate thing to define the Philatic cohomology for these varieties in characteristic P, but when it's done, you have a cohomology theory that behaves just like usual kind of singular cohomology of, of manifolds, or Durand, also like Durand cohomology of manifolds. And so, um, and, and in particular, you do have that left shift fixed point formalism. Like you can just count fixed points using left shift fixed point formula. And then, so then literally, th then, you know, this, this formula where the left-hand side is basically counting kind of fixed points under iterates of this Fabianian automorphism, And then the right-hand side has something to do with the way Fabianian taxon cohomology. That's literally just applying a fixed point formula and then making manipulations. And that's how you will kind of do these dynamical zeta functions as well. If you have a manifold and you have this automorphism and you want to compute the, um, uh, you know, you can like look at this sort of generating function where you count the number of, now you'll be computing the number of fixed points under the automorphism to the nth power. That will be what will be playing the role of the numerator. You can find a cohomological formula for it just by left shift fixed point formalism of exactly the, sorry, exactly the same, uh, style so so that's so that's kind of one thing is that it's basically they're literally the same formulas once you have a cohomological formalism and where left shift fixed point is valid so that's i mean that's maybe at least a partial answer to like the background to your question but then the kind of thing you can also do is you could for example uh and, and that's how you for example that's like you no one did ask but someone could have asked how the hell did i know how to count points on this elliptic curve, like this, you know, when I, when I write down this L function formula and I kind of unwrapped it, I'm giving you a formula for how to count points. I'm telling you that counting points on this elliptic curve has something to do with some Gaussian integers. And you could ask kind of how I know that. And well, the way I know it is that, for example, this number pi is an endomorphism of that elliptic curve. Right, that elliptic curve has CM by the Gaussian integer. So that pi acts on this elliptic curve as some endomorphism. But it turns out that if I look at what that pi does and I study how it acts on n torsion, we will, it will induce the Gawa Fabianian automorphism. It will induce that frob p that was in the previous slides. That's a, that's a theorem that you can prove. And so what that means is that if I wanted to compute this zeta function, you know, if I wanted to compute 
this this kind of these formulas for that elliptic curve i don't have to do it in characteristic p because actually this pi is a perfectly good endomorphism of the elliptic curve in characteristic zero that is inducing the Fabianus in characteristic p so i could use the left shed's formulas of in characteristic zero and using this pi and that's what i can do and that's where this formula for the l function comes from so what so in some good situations the Fabianus guys that the Fabianus automorphisms actually come from kind of which are kind of either mob p things or in characteristic zero they live life as gawa elements and gawa elements are very nasty from the point of view of say a left shed you know dynamics because they're not you know gawa q over q is not continuous the way it acts on the points of this elliptic curve but in some kind of good situations you can you can actually find an honest endomorphism of the variety which is lifting gawa and then you can really compute those zeta functions just from a, you know, like thinking like dynamically and that's actually how um for example the the ha the the kind of vacant jacks of elliptic curves were first proved this way it was proved that if you had an elliptic curve in characteristic p you could find a lift of it that was had cm and so then you could find a cm of that lift that behaved like the mob p and so you could use like basically this dynamical zeta function point of view to compute what was going on so the, i guess the issue is that most varieties over q don't have anything like cm and so they don't have these endomorphisms um so that strategy for kind of studying these guys only works sometimes but even though it only works sometimes it is a super powerful strategy that is used a lot especially if people are, care about characteristic p geometry to begin with so they don't mind so they're happy to like use any lift to characteristic zero that they can that will help them study their mob p situation if you kind of have a if you start with a given characteristic zero situation it is what it is and what but if you start with the mob p situation you know, just like there are lots of numbers in the residue class of three mod five so there are going to be lots of varieties over q which give you a given variety mod five and so um so people will like make an effort to try and prove theorems that among all the possible like there'll, there'll be arguments in moduli space theory or deformation theory that they'll show that like they're a lot they'll study the deformations of a mod five variety to characteristic zero and they'll try to prove that there are certain points in the moduli space that have more symmetries and that maybe lift for benius. and that's the kind of whole industry and it's a whole technique for applying more um, classical kind of cohomological or dynamical or Hodge theoretic techniques to to these kind of zeta functions and related things. So I don't know. That's anyway that what comes to mind, kind of based on your question. I don't know if it connects to. It was helpful. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Any other questions? <sighs> So, well, if not, maybe we I think, should- I think the hosts might have departed. So. Yeah, maybe we should, yeah, I think we should maybe call it a, well, an afternoon or evening, depending on where you are in the world. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank anyway, you. Thanks for uh, coming and asking great questions and uh, see you virtually in the, in the near future. Bye everyone.